John chapter 19, if you would. I thought of something uh, today, too, in relation to this that uh, really, um, I think it's going to add to what we're studying. We're studying, uh, last Wednesday night, um, we were studying the, the thorns, the crown of thorns that Jesus wore, and what is the meaning of it? Why did Jesus, why is the Bible put that in there? Why did they even put the crown of thorns on his head? And it was, what's funny is that it was the Roman soldiers who did that. It wasn't Jesus who said, make me a crown of thorns and put it on my head. The soldiers came up with that, but they had no idea that God was, was moving in them to do this. This fulfilled something that God wanted us to see. And um, I was reading... Um, a little bit in Manly Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages today, and he got to a point where he was he was discussing how uh, the Illuminati and the and the mystery religion people have hidden their secrets, like in paintings or like in in plays that they've put on and written, and so on, or they they hide it in different ways, but they put secret messages. Uh, in the things they do. Well, God did too, but he always tells you what it is. If you'll look for it, you'll see it and, and you'll, it'll be clear. And it's easy to look for too. Uh, I was talking to um, uh, Brother Jerry Gamble today at uh, one of the stores we went at. He was, he come in there and uh, I told him that, yeah, you know, he's got a mind like me. He likes to research all these things. And, and, um, I said that I asked God to show me the secret of Freemasonry because I read all their books. I mean, I read books. I read 830 pages of Morals and Dogma and never found it in there. They talk about it, but they don't tell you what it is. And, and I asked God, God, show it to me. And he said, do you want to know it? I said, yeah. And he said, study the word secret. I went, and I went, well, that's what I'm wanting to know. Their secret. He said, no, it's their secret. Find it. And so I went looking at the word secret in the Bible. And sure enough, there it is in Daniel chapter 2. And once I had that and had, knew I had the key, I could go back to Morals and Dogma and I could show you everything in there that they have locked up and I can take the key and open it up right up for you. It's just that simple. So in John chapter 19, we'll read verses 1 through 5 and uh, then we'll go to prayer. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted. And remember what that means. They, they, they wound it together to where it literally looked like DNA when they were done. Platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him, and remember what a crown is. It shows that it's somebody reigning over something. And in this case, it's going to be the curse of sin. And because we learned that from Adam, and what God cursed the ground with was thorns. And so... Um, that is a picture of you and I who we read the Bible and we're feeding off the Bible. Adam's labor is he does it by the sweat of his face and he eats by the sweat of his face and he's eating it in sorrow because he's planted all this good grain and all he's getting up is thorns and thistles because the ground is cursed because of Adam's sin. And so you and I, we're doing something that is absolutely the greatest thing in the world to do, and that is to read the Bible and let God sow good things into us, but it's mingled with the thorns in our life. We have to deal with this all the way through our life until we die and go to heaven. So the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they, they were laughing you know, at doing this. They were mocking him with this. And they smote him with their hands. And Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. All right, Pilate, so why are you doing this? Because it's political. It would be suicide not to. He's got to deal with these Jews. He doesn't want, to, he doesn't want Caesar to know that he doesn't have control over those Jews. He wants Caesar to know he's doing a good job or he'll take his little uh, nice little job away that he's got. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. That also is part of it. And, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Father, we ask your blessings tonight on your word. We thank you for it. Lord, what a gift you've given us. The purity, the beauty of this old book. Father, it is everything in our lives that we are and everything that we want to be. Teach us some good things tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, 
Last Wednesday night uh, in Genesis 3, um, this is the curse now. Why did Jesus wear the thorns? What, the, what did the crown represent? It represents a king ruling over him. And it represents death and it represents sin. It represents the curse of Adam's sin. So in Genesis 3, 17, unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou... And that's what we're doing. Okay? John, you worked all day. Melissa, you worked all day. You guys worked all day. I worked all day. And we put in our labor so that the, at the end of the day, we could sit down to a halfway decent meal of something, fill our bodies up. And I love it that God made everything that's good for me taste good. I may not have thought it tasted good when I was eight. But when I'm 58, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. It tastes good. Um, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. For out of it wast thou taken for dust thou art. What color does dirt come in? Brown, red, yellow, black. What, are, what colors? Is that it? There's no green dirt. And there are no green people. There is tan dirt and there's tan people. There is black dirt and there are black people. There's red dirt and there are red people. There's yellow dirt and there are yellow people. There's no color of dirt that is not mirrored in human beings. God picked it that way. Why? So that we would understand he gets nothing out of our flesh. Nothing except ground to sow the seed on. That's it. Uh, because she was, anyway, Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Um, I don't have my Bible software hooked up here, but I'm fixing to in a minute because I want you to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 2 in it. Turn, turn your Bibles, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to show you something that occurred to me today. If you ever worry that I'm going to get up here ready to teach a lesson and I've run out of something to talk about, don't worry. Genesis 2. I'm going to show you how God makes this relevant. Unless you say revelant. Um, notice in verse 8, this is what I have up on the screen here. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, and the, we have a river that goes forth out of that and busts off into four heads and so on. And look at verse uh, 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, and I, I was thinking about this today because when I teach this thing on thorns, somebody might get the impression that I am teaching a works-based Salvation, that I'm telling you, you've got to work to do this. You've got to work to get this and work to get the thorns out of your life and so on. God has Adam in a state of perfection. Adam has not sinned. And yet he has put Adam in his garden to do what? To dress it, to take care of it, to do the upkeep on it. And you can't say that Adam is now working for his dinner here. Because there's trees all over this garden. They're all full of fruit. Adam can just go, if he gets hungry, he can eat. He doesn't have to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He can eat all day long if he wants. And whatever fruit he wants. So this is not an issue of us having to do things to maintain our salvation. 
This has to do with something that God gives us joy in. And if it's, listen, if you love what you're doing, it's not work. It's not work. It's just doing what you love doing. And God has put it in us just like he has the horse. You think a horse wants to be tied up in a barn all day long and lay down all day long and not do anything? Horses want to get up. Horses want to run. Horses want somebody on their back giving them a ride, okay? That's what horses like. And there are other creatures who have a nature like that where they like doing something. And God has put it in us to be satisfied. I'll never forget the first time I, uh, I helped Sterling and Steve paint a house. It was after I got, uh, right before I got married to Lisa. And I remember the first house I did with them. We got all done with the house. And I looked back for the first time really in my life looking at a, at a day's full of work. And I went, I did that. That looks good. Until Ron came in and said, nah, this don't look good. Well, I learned, okay? But I got satisfaction out of that. As a young man, God, and God knew this, he wouldn't let me pastor at the time and I wanted to because I didn't want to do anything. God said, no, you're going to work and I'm going to teach you how to work. I'm going to teach you how to get satisfaction out of what you're doing. Best thing for me. So anyway, God is putting the man in here. In verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Just one rule hanging on the wall here. One, one code, one guideline, that's it. And Adam then, not only does he get to dress the garden, but what, did, what other job did God give him before the fall? Naming the animals. And he named every creature that is on the earth. He named them a name. And so, talking about the mind of Adam, I mean, it's better than a computer, right? And so he is enjoying this thing that he gets to do with himself. Oh, virus protection, be gone. All right, now, so keep that in mind now, because he has this beautiful, lush garden, and he's fixing to lose it. Why? Because God cursed the ground because of his sin, okay? So... Uh, places like Joshua, God said that the nations that they left in Canaan land, God gave this to Israel like God gave Adam the garden. And God basically said, here's your garden, Joshua. I want all this trash cleaned out. I want all them thorns and thistles. I want them all rooted up and get them out of there because your land is going to be a land flowing with milk and honey and it's going to look great. And Joshua goes in and he doesn't do the job that God gave him to do. He left the, some of the nations in that land. He left thorns and thistles in that land. He didn't root them all out. And God said, now you're going to have to deal with it. He said, these things are going to be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land, which the Lord, in other words, you're going to have to deal with it until the day you die. And who, who among us would dare stand up and say, I have no thorns, I have no thistles, God has removed them all, and I'm essentially what you're saying is that you are living not only in a sin-free environment, but you're living in a temptation-free environment. And you are not living in a temptation-free environment, and you're not living in a sin-free environment either. So, Judges, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Uh, let me give you a little word knowledge. What is a... Uh, there's a name that people call Jews. It's not really in use now, huh? No, we're the Goyim. Yeah, Gentiles are Goy. Um, but there was a name, especially in America, that was given to Jews when they came over through Ellis Island. And um, it was a derogatory name, but they were called Kikes. K-I-K-E-S or K-Y-K-E-S. Kikes. Has anybody ever heard of that? You know where it comes from? The word Gilgal. Because Gilgal means circle and a kike was actually a keikel 
That was the Yiddish word that they used for a circle because a lot of the Jews that came over were from persecuted countries and they were poorly educated. Most of them could not write their name. And to a Jew, you don't put an X on a paper. Why? It's a cross. They're Jews. So they would put a circle where they were supposed to put their name and then somebody would print their name out for them uh, because they couldn't spell it. They couldn't write it out. So they were called the Keikels or the Kikes. And it comes from Gilgal. And what's interesting is Gilgal Gal is called that because God said, it is here that I will roll away the reproach that's on you. Roll it like a circle. Okay. Anyway, from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. That was their part. That was what they had to do. It's like Jesus going to Lazarus' tomb and he could have just went like that and the stone rolled itself away. But Jesus did not do that. He told them, take ye away the stone. Why? Because ye put it there. You put this man in that jail, in that tomb, in that prison. You, you bound him up in there. You rolled the stone of a fence in front of him. And now I cannot resurrect him and I won't resurrect him until you remove that stone of offense away from him. And they had to do that. And God said, you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Verse three, wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare unto you. So anybody who worships gods um, I was telling was Matthew, uh, we were talking about John Denver. He believed in his life, he was full of new age teachings. And he believed, he said this in Life Magazine. They did a big spread on him back in the 70s. And he said, I believe that I will continue to evolve and get better. And he said, I will be a God one day. That's not how his life turned out. John Denver was a pilot. His dad taught him how to fly planes and he loved to fly. He loved to fly airplanes. But the FAA took away his pilot's license temporarily until he stopped drinking. They said, you have, you consume way too much alcohol. We're not letting you fly any planes because you're dangerous. And how did he die? Airplane crash. Okay. He, I doubt that he be, that I doubt that that's the God that he had in mind. I doubt it seriously. But God said their gods are going to be a snare unto you. You're going to end up worshiping them, or praying to them. Like I said during the song well ago, it's not Mary that gives us the blessings of God. It's not Mary that saves. It's not Mary that does anything. Don't pray to Mary. Don't pray to Saint Joseph. Don't pray to Saint Matthew. Don't pray to uh, Pope uh, Saint. John Paul II, Saint Mother Teresa, don't pray to these people. They cannot answer your prayers. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words, all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. Why? Because now they knew that they had it difficult, not easy, because of what they did. They didn't clean it up. And now they're going to have to deal with it for the rest of their life. Now, turn to 2 Samuel 23. This is an interesting phrase because I'm working on a new uh, Watchman series, I think. I don't even know where it's going yet. But I started um, going back over all the places in the Bible where it mentions son or sons of Belial, children of Belial, daughters of Belial. Belial is who? Satan. Uh, we get that from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. What concord hath Christ with Belial? And the name, the word Belial means worthless, but I like to think of it, it has Bel in it, or Baal. And so does Oh, I learned something too. Um, be careful what you name your daughters and granddaughters. Uh, I've, I've always said that nobody names their daughters Jezebel anymore. 
Well, that's not quite true. Because the letter J can become a Y. Now say the word. Say it again. Now shorten the, shorten the E, turn the E into a short I. Isabel. Yeah, it's a, it's a variant of Jezebel's what it is. Yeah, yeah, so just maybe you might want to stay away from that, all right? Yeah, you don't want to scar them for life, okay? Uh, but anyway, 2 Samuel chapter 23 mentions here the sons of Belial. And what I've done is I've taken a literal approach to this. And the Bible, uh, the Bible not only allows it, but the Bible teaches that. When Jesus told them in Matthew 23, he said, you serpents, you generation of vipers. Um, year of your father, the devil. Things like that. Um, the, um, the false prophet that withstood Paul uh, when he was trying to witness to Sergius Paulus. And um, there was a, a, a wizard there who was a Jew. And Paul called him, you child of the devil. Okay. Well, um, so does the Bible call people who are lost the child of Satan, the offspring. Um, when the Pharisees encompass land and sea to make a convert, they make them twofold the child of who? Hell. And that is being born again of corruptible seed. It's the second death is what it brings. And so I'm taking this literal approach and you go to Genesis 6 then you see the sons of God and the daughters of men. And you know, that's not right. God told them not to do that. Well, they broke God's commandments. They left their, um, they left their first estate. They came down to earth. They took wives of all which they chose and they mated with them and they produced this wicked offspring of giants, a race of giants on the earth, literally giants. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, um, Andre the Giant, the wrestler, okay? I'm talking about Goliath. I'm talking about Og, who was apparently 13 and a half feet tall. You meet that guy, you do what he says. And usually these guys were kings or champions, all right? But anyway, so 2 Samuel 23 gives us a little bit of clue as to what the sons of Belial represent. The sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns. So when you're dealing with thorns, we've learned from uh, judges, we learned from Joshua that we're talking about a group of people that are thorns to us and they will withstand us and they will vex us and they will torment us. They will try to scare us into not serving God anymore. They will try to deceive us. And, and we have to put up with that. I keep praying that God makes this country better. I don't think he's going to do that the way I want him to. I do think God is going to make his church better. By letting the, the other people turn into their worst ever. Through that, God is going to condition his people to be better than they were. And God has put that in all of us. We, we grow up and we aspire to do things that maybe our parents didn't do or couldn't do. And I'm talking about good things. We aspire to, to, to want to make a nice living for our family, to aspire to uh, try to do the best we can at what we're doing. It's in our nature that way. And God put it there for us to get that satisfaction out of life. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good friend, a good guy. I want you to like me. I want to do good and right things. I got a little couple of things hold me back from it though. And I don't like that. But it's something I got to deal with and something I got to learn with. I saw a, um, and this is another YouTube video that came up my feed yesterday. It was uh, 
a, a young guy that had been burnt so badly in some kind of fire. He was missing most of this arm. He was missing his hand here. His face was just nothing but a giant scar of skin tissue. They covered over his eyes because it burned his eyes out. And he, they, did, he didn't have a nose, just two holes here. And his teeth were just like sticking, protruding out of a mouth. It looked like he had a mask on, but it was... And he was just nearly destroyed. I'm looking at that and I'm going, why in the world would you want to live that way? And you know what happened? Uh, he always wanted to be a police officer. And so one day the cops, they, they made a uniform for him and they dressed him up and let him go on calls with a squad car one day. And he got to call in and he talks pretty plain. He, he wants a better life for himself. In spite of his challenge, he wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to do something better than what he's doing. He wants to be something. That's in us. That's in lost people too. Okay? And so, here the sons of Belial shall be all of them their thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. That means you cannot just get rid of them by yourself. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. So it's not only telling you the annoyance of the sons of Belial being as thorns, but it's also going to tell you what's going to happen to them at the end. They're all going to be burned up with fire. And the Bible says that in another place too. But notice the connection there between thorns and between a group of people. And there's always going to be people, folks, that are going to withstand us. We're always going to be... Uh, everything that we do here is always under threat of being destroyed. Daily. Under threat of being destroyed. I am sometimes amazed that we're still doing what we're doing. Because of the number of times that our enemy has tried to stop it. And I mean, seriously tried to stop it. And so it's always going to be a fight. It's always going to be a war, but it's always going to be victorious. Amen. If I didn't believe that, I, I would have got out by now. If I did not believe that, I would have left. Alicia will tell you, I keep telling my girls, you guys need to move away from me. 300 miles minimum. Maybe I shouldn't say that certain days. Moving van, here it comes. Beep, beep, beep. But just so the devil doesn't harass them. And they always say, Dad, he's going to get us no matter where we are. All right, well, get back to work then. <laughs> what are you doing talking to me? Get busy. Psalm 118, verse 10. All nations come past me about. See, now we're going to make another connection with people. All nations compass me about. But in the name, now remember how. Uh, Elisha and his uh, servant Gehazi are circled with the enemy, chariots and horses. And Elisha's, you know, sitting there filing his nails and uh, taking care of himself and checking his watch every now and then. And Gehazi's going, what are you doing? We're all going to get killed. Look at us. Look at us around us. God opened his eyes. And he opens his eyes, he sees chariots of fire and horses of fire all the way around. And he said, they be, they be with us more than they be with him. So quit worrying about it. But he said, they compass me about, yea, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Notice that I want to, or I might, or if I have enough uh, strength, or if I have enough money, or if I get enough people on my side, or if I pray enough, then God's going to do this. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. The final victory is yours. They compass me about like bees. Bees sting, don't they? Things that have a sting are going to be related to death. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. So they are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. It's twice now he says it. Do you believe it now? The double witness, it's said it twice. Proverbs 24, turn there. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. See, this gets into the garden now. God has given you a garden. 
Okay? John, you have a garden. Courtney, you've got your little garden over there. And uh, everybody's got their garden. Okay? It's your family. It's your life. It's who you are. So Proverbs 24, 29, Say not, I will do some, or I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Verse 30, I went by the field of the slothful. What does a sloth do? Hi. Welcome to the license office. Can I help you? That's what a sloth does. Do what? Yeah. They work for the government. And by the vineyard of a man void of understanding. So a man who has a Bible, but he won't read it. He has the, the ways of God and the work of God but he doesn't abide by it. He's been given this precious garden full of herbs or full of vegetables or full of whatever. And he won't do anything with it. It's a waste. He's slothful and he's void of understanding. He doesn't care. He's had... Everything given to him all his life. He hasn't had to work for anything. hasn't had to earn anything. So he's just given stuff. And he thinks that that's the way life should continue on. It, it's amazed me that a generation of children that I've seen grow up in my lifetime are now the ones who are screaming at everybody wanting a socialist or communist form of government in America. Why is it that they want that, Alicia? So they don't have to do anything. They will get paid $20 an hour or $25 an hour for nothing. Absolutely nothing. And they want it that way because they deserve it. They, they keep talking about how the rich are always getting richer. You know why the rich are getting richer? They do something. They do something with their time. You think Donald Trump just got money handed to him? No, he's smart. And he worked and he earned it. Just because he's better at it than you doesn't mean. Okay? But you can make a living. What is it people did? Go study the life of um, George Washington Carver. Former slave. The inventor of peanut butter. Amen. Amen. And he testified before Congress. They asked him, Mr. Carver, how is it that you came up with the idea of making milk from a peanut? He said, I prayed and I asked the Lord one day, God, would you show me how to make milk out of a peanut? And he said, the Lord showed me how to make milk out of a peanut. So I made milk out of a peanut. He didn't complain that he'd been a slave. He didn't want everything torn down. He wasn't going to burn the city down and protest. He just said, you know what? I'm going to do better than that. And no matter if they try to stop me, I'm just going to go around them. I'm going to jump over them. And I'm just going to keep on going. Tell them to stop me. That's how you're supposed to live. So, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns. And nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Do what? Yeah. So, the stone wall, what was that there for? To keep illegals out. And they are illegals. They are not immigrants. They are illegal. They do not have a right to come here unless they want to do it legally. Sister Eunice back here didn't have a problem. 
Michael didn't have a problem. They both come over here, got permission, got green cards, got acceptance. They're here legally. I don't have a problem with it. But there's a reason why you have a stone wall around your most precious things. Amen? And I'm telling you, the best idea for them people down in Texas to come up with was when they come across the border, put them on a bus, send them to Washington, D.C., send them to Chicago, send them to Portland, Oregon, send them to Seattle, Washington, send them to all them liberal cities now that says they, they, they have a right to come over here. It's nonsense. And stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. And I looked upon it and received instruction. You see, let me give you something just to help your head a little bit. In case you think that capitalist America is some evil invention and that we need to do away with it and replace it with socialism and or communism, which is their first cousins of each other. The reason why you put a wall around your stuff is because it is your stuff. God gives man the right to own property, to own land, to own to the right to work, to labor, to sell and trade his labor, no matter what it is, for goods and services, so that when he buys them and pays for them, they are now legally his property. And if anybody steals them, they should be under penalty of law. Because God even wrote it into the commandments. Thou shalt not steal. And you ought to read Proverbs chapter 1 about how the wicked say, let's all have one purse. That's in Proverbs 1. I dare you to read it. Okay? Let's all have one purse now. Let's all just pull our money together and we'll all take our share out of it. What if they don't do anything? It doesn't work. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. He said, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. In other words, you don't work, you don't get it. You don't contribute, you don't deserve. Well, what about Christian love? Yeah, there's, there's a time for Christian charity for those who cannot. There is a difference in between cannot and won't. Won't not. And God speaks always against those who refuse and those who won't. And so now take this now, apply it. You know what's yours, okay? Your family's yours, your church is yours, your faith is yours. Um, it's, it was even purchased for you. Okay? God gave you salvation. He gave you this life. He gave you this belief system. He gave you this faith. He gave you this amazing book here. He gave you a wonderful pastor. Thanks for the shirt, by the way. Tell everybody what it said. I don't either. Hey, Michael. Where, go in there. Go in my room there and look for that T-shirt. that I thought I brought it down to my office, but I, apparently I didn't. It's funny. You guys see this thing. It's hilarious. But anyway, you have these things and you've worked and earned them. But now you're going to let everything just be stolen and take away from you. So that, yeah, throw that down here. No, through the window. This was good. It says, Pastor warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. <laughs> I love it. And that's true, too. My mom's all the time saying, well, don't bring that up. Don't tell them that. Isaiah 34, 13, thorns. Look at here. This is, this is where it turns out. Here's the guy being warned that it's going to turn out this way. 
And then here's the guy that it's already happened to. Thorns shall come up in her palaces. Nettles and brambles. How, how pretty are those? Nettles and brambles and thorns. They're not. And especially when they're growing in a building, in a house, in a pla- you've You've spent thousands and thousands of dollars on this house. You got this nice house, but you don't do anything with it. And you just let dirt pile up and you let mold build up everywhere. And you don't, you don't fix a leaky faucet. You don't do anything. It just gets dirty. The, the sink is full of nasty dishes. The, the stove and oven has got a pot of something that's been sitting on there for three weeks. Got mold growing out of it. Got a spoon welded to the side of it with crud. And this is how you live. God gave you something better than that. He wants you to have something better than that. Clean up. Amen. Thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be a habitation of dragons in a court for owls. That's, listen, when the thorns are growing up, I guarantee you the the dragons are going to be there. They love living in that kind of environment. That is their home court right there. It is where they uh, hide. It is where they dwell. It is where they live. And it is where they will build a nest. And they will hatch out more owls. And they will hatch out more dragons. And pretty soon you ain't got nothing now. Your life has been taken over for you. Now everything's been taken away. Jeremiah 4, 3, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground. Fallow means what? What does it mean? It's a field. In the state of Missouri, you can tell a field that has gone fallow. How can you tell it? Huh? It's full of cedar trees. Cedar trees will take over a nice field, if you don't do anything with it, it'll be full of cedars. There, next to our house, going down Reynolds Creek Road, um, that whole area there used to be a nice field. I can tell now because there's a great big cedar patch going all the way through there, almost all the way down to the bottom of the hill. Somebody had that 100 years ago or so as a nice field. And... Um, Anyway, I'm kind of getting off. But anyway, that's what happens to it. And now it's not a nice field anymore. Now it's back full of cedars again. And you've lost that. And that's what God says is happening here. You've got fallow ground. And so what you have to do then is take the word of God, which is a sword, and have God beat it into a plow share for you and he will god then will plow up hard angry dry ground he'll plow it up he'll till it make the clods break up break up your fallow ground and don't be stupid enough to sow among thorns let me tell you in in one Sort of one application what that means. Trying to, trying to force somebody who is not a Christian. Trying to get them to live as a Christian should live. Will it work? It won't work. It won't work. Because the thorns, we know what the thorns do, according to Matthew and Mark and Luke. The thorns will choke out the word of God that was sown into their life. And it'll be like you never planted anything there because it will not bring forth fruit. So the remedy here is to not be this guy, the slothful guy, who didn't plow up his ground and that's the only way to get rid of them thorns because i i keep pulling them out and they keep growing back and if i don't get them by the roots they're just going to come back again and so i bought myself an electric tiller it's just a handheld it's on a long pole so i don't have to bend over because you know i don't like doing that 
and um, you just plows that stuff up and cuts it up and gets it dug up and I just pull them out and throw them there in the yard and the lawnmower chops them all to pieces and I've got nice soft ground there to do anything I want to or the next time when they start growing I know that ground's not hard I just reach over and pick it up and it just comes out of there but the ground is still full of them I'm never going to run out of thorns as long as I live that's always going to be there and so I have to deal with that but if I want something halfway decent nice growing in front of my house instead of something that looks like the Adams family lives there da 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 Okay, then I've got to keep that cleaned up and keep the weeds pulled out and keep the thorns pulled out and maybe come uh, October plant some of those um, mums that Lisa likes, those fall mums, they blossom out in the fall and then maybe plant something there in the spring again that'll come up year round and stuff like that and that's what I got to do and that's what I have to do with my life. That's what I have to do with my ministry. God's, listen, God's given me something I could have never, never dreamed of. I know it. And I'm not bragging because I didn't do it. God gave it to me. But I know how to single-handedly destroy every bit of this. I know how. Don't ask me. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So it's my responsibility to make sure the thorns and the nettles. And you know what? That may from time to time include people. If there are people that I know are bad news for this church I'll deal with it I don't like it yeah I end up very sour for a long time after that but I will deal with it because I've seen too many times people move in here who only want to take and destroy they don't want to take it and keep it for theirs they just want to destroy it we never have found out anybody, Alicia, that we can say we think they're taking our mail and washing our checks. We haven't found that. Nobody, nobody has called us and said, um, hey, our checks came back and we looked at them and yeah, they, somebody changed the name on it and uh, you know, here's evidence. We don't have anybody. But I know for a fact that somebody was stealing our mail and what they were doing with it, I have no idea. It wouldn't surprise me if they were just tossing it so that we couldn't have it. And you say, who would do that? Listen, I've made enough people mad that, yeah, it could be somebody that if we found out we're going, well, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so I have a responsibility to make sure the garden is clean and taken care of, to know what the garden needs from time to time, and to know what could be dangerous. And uh, sometimes that's gonna come from my wife. She gets a little feeling sometimes, and I don't just act on that. I pray and say, God, you show me, because evidently she's worried about something. You show me what's going on. And God will always do that. It's to be a second witness, but. But anyway, verse 34, so shall thy poverty come as one. I, I, I don't want us to go back to what we used to be as a church a long time ago. Because we were doing nothing for nobody. Now we're accomplishing something. God's letting us do that. And he's trusting us that we will all do it in our way or take our part doing it. And we will fulfill what God wants us to do. And in doing that, we ourselves will be fulfilled. We'll be happy that we did this for somebody. And, um, and that's what I love about this church. Nobody really has ever fought me over anything that we started doing. 
So now maybe some people to say, well, I don't know if that's going to work. Well, if it doesn't work, then God will show it to us. But anyway, to God be the glory. Amen.